Hey guys, it's that pastor with none of them answers. And I have an idea though. I want to try it. There's an organization called DonorSeed.com. You can go there and check it out right now. It's D-O-N-O-R-S-E-E.com. And I would like to take a stab at making this podcast not only something that people listen to, but something that the listeners can combine efforts and actually do something together. So here's what I really want to encourage you to do. And this, for some of you, you give to organizations, you give to your church and, and all that stuff. Just just do that. Don't, don't, even, don't even bat an eye at this. But for those of you that don't give money, um, and don't, don't part from any of your money ever, I'm going to just challenge you to turn this podcast listening experience to an opportunity to give. So what I'm going to do is ask people to go to pastorwithnoanswers.com, go to the Patreon page. There's a place where it says uh, contribute. And I am going to give all of that first month's new members money away. So everyone that joins uh, in, in, the next, in this next month, I'm going to give all that money to a specific project on DonorSea. Go to DonorSea. There's there's actual things that you can give specifically for and just see what we can do together. Now, here's the deal. After that month, if you're not interested in being in the... I, I would assume if you're going on here just, just to help uh, give to DonorSea, you're not interested in being a uh, pastor with no answers patron. And that's fine and dandy. It's only a means of getting this money funneled to a nonprofit organization. That's the only thing I have set up right now. So let's try this. I would love to try this. Uh, and some of you, it's just like, I don't want, I don't feel like getting my credit card out and, and, and doing all that stuff. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe think about it. I would really love, and I will report back in a couple of weeks and I will tell you if it was a complete disaster uh, or I will tell you if it was a success but donorseed.com and then maybe even we can uh, get to a point where we have some sort of a format in voting for the sorts of things that we support on Donorseed but let's give it a whirl go to pastorwithnoanswers.com and go to uh, contribute or, or be a patron and whatever level you join, I will take that money, I will give it to a specific project, and then you can back out of your uh, patronage the very next month. My name is Stephen Long, the host of Sacred Tension. And you are listening to The Pastor With No Answers. All right, Stephen, it's good to have you on here. I'll tell our listeners the connection here. You or, or may, you know a guy named Justin Bryant, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, he helps me quite a bit with the show. Okay, good, good. So he was telling me about his podcast, and I was asking him some questions. And, um, you know, anytime a personal friend tells me a podcast they're involved with, you know, I'm just a good guy, dude. I'm going to check it out. And I checked it out. I was like, <laughs> hey, this isn't shit. <laughs> this, is, this is actually... Oh. That, is, that is the nicest compliment you could, you could give me because there are so many indie podcasters like myself who... You know, I'm I'm always terrified when they ask me to listen to their podcast because I'm like, <laughs> I'm just going to have to tell them it's f- shitty. <laughs> anyway, so that is a very, very high compliment. Awesome. I really appreciate awesome. that. So, yeah, he didn't let me down. So, hey, man, I hope you don't let me down either. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my now, best. You know, so I was... Um, I'll give some people some behind-the-scenes info. You know, often when I really don't know much about a guest that I'm having on other than just some some general stuff. I have a little questionnaire that helps me with not only the questions, but then also just assessing whether or not I can you know make a, a show out of it. And you definitely have some super interesting stuff. So what I'd like to do, I went jogging early this morning and I listened to your part one of uh, interviewing and, and correct my terminology, I'm going to screw things all up, but basically That's uh, all right. a satanic temple. He is part of a satanic temple. 
Is, yes. Okay. He, uh, well, the Satanic Temple is a is a religion, a Satanic religion. Okay. And he, the guy I interviewed, was a spokesperson for it. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Very cool. And um, you are also a gay male Christian, correct? I, I, people know you're a male. Uh, I, as far as I know, I'm still male, right. yes. So you're not transgender. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not trans. No, I am. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm a gay Christian. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, lots of questions. Obviously, I want to talk about the Satanism because you, are, you consider yourself also a part of the Satanic Temple, correct? Well, so the Satanic Temple, the first thing to understand about it is that it is different from the Church of Satan, which was founded by Anton LaVey in the 60s. And, you know, it's kind of that's kind of the flagship Satanic organization that's been around for decades. The Satanic Temple is very new. It's been around for like five years. Um, It's very much like a political organization. They rally for freedom of speech. They rally for religious freedom, um, for uh, the rights of minorities and women, and they are also genuinely Satanists. Um, But Satanism, meaning it does not mean worshiping. Yeah, it doesn't mean worshiping a literal spiritual deity. Right, there's no belief in supernatural at all. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, You know, the Satanism is uh, is first and foremost concerned with the material world. Yeah, and rooting rooting one's concerns in the well being of now versus the well being of an eternity after death. So, so let's, and, yeah. let's, let's um, at, at least for my clarity, let's go ahead and establish clearly, I know you already have it, but, but the, for sure. the log, not logical, but the technical terminology. So you have Satanism, worship of Satan, and then you have Satanic Temple, which is what you are involved in. And uh, obviously well, I understand so it, the difference. One is an actual worship of Satan. One is just a, Pretty much, I don't believe in the supernatural, but and, and we'll get into more of what you guys are after and everything. But it's it's is that the two terminologies: satanic temple and then Satanism, worship of Satan. Well, it all falls really under the umbrella of Satanism. You're realizing uh, really quickly right now that that you are on a dumbing it down podcast, right? Okay, <laughs> that is all right. Um, uh, no worries. So it, it's all under the category of Satanism. Right. In the same way with, you know, something like Buddhism, you have Buddhists who believe in spiritual, you, to, in a spiritual realm. You have Buddhists who are non-theistic. You have Christians who are non-theistic. You have Christians who are theistic. You have, so there are, there's a wide variety of beliefs within these specific traditions. And it's very much the same with Satanism. You do find Satanists who do actually worship demons and whatnot but then you all generally speaking you find satanists who uh are concerned first and foremost with the material realm and they adhere to satan because they find meaning and empowerment in the symbol of uh satan rebelling against the undue authority of an oppressive God in Eden. And now this is really drawing from the literary tradition and not just from the Bible. So, you know, to understand this, you kind of have to understand Milton and Paradise Lost and the romantic literary tradition of, of Satan. And so I think the important distinction here is that Satanism and Christianity and generally the other world religions, they are concerned with two different planes of existence, right? So uh, Christianity is largely concerned with ultimate reality. Right. It's ultimately, it, it's concerned with cosmic questions, right. with the nature of the cosmos. And so when Christians talk about God and Satan and spirits and morality, they're, they're talking about the nature of the universe. Whereas when a Satanist says the word God, or at least I won't talk for all Satanists, but I'll talk for myself as a member of the Satanic temple, for the way I understand it is that God and Satan are metaphors for social relationships, yeah. for the relationship between subordinate and the powerful, yeah. the relationship between undue authority and those who are oppressed by it. It's a religion focused on social relationships, and it is only concerned 
with the cosmos insofar as it says we will not go beyond uh, we will not go beyond the magisterium of science. We're going to remain materialistically agnostic. We're going to say, you know, it's probably just the material universe out there. Um, and I will believe it. I will believe things about the outer world, about the universe, as science slowly reveals it to us. Um, so ultimately, uh, ultimately, Satanism and Christianity, they are dealing with two different planes of existence. And, you know, I think from the offset, if you don't really get that, it will just be hopelessly confusing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was actually really surprised to hear that there was... A form of Satanism that did not believe in any sort of supernatural. Like I just didn't even. Know that yeah. The, One thing that I thought was super yeah. interesting that you guys discussed and, and you touched on it just now. We won't spend too much time on it, but I just want to point it out. Is I thought it was really cool how you mentioned in that episode just the different narratives that one can get out of the the creation Adam and Eve story, for instance, and. Like, honestly, I have no problem with saying I I don't see the story how the satanic temple would see it. But I think it is actually very interesting. Now, absolutely. Do you see all of them on equal playing fields and and hey, we can get truth out of different narratives because I would describe the narrative of I mean, I, I don't believe. I think I'm at a place now to where I just I don't believe that it was an actual thing that happened. If anything, it was written in in a very poetic form but i I think i'm kind of lost it on the whole literal adam and eve deal but i definitely see it more of a protective loving god that says look you, you you can't handle the stuff that i know so i'm telling you don't try to get into that stuff because i would love for you to protect you from this so that you don't have to experience evil you don't have to toil with things that destroy you just leave that stuff alone and follow me and you're good to go. That's, that's how I see the story. Whereas you point out, you know, this, this oppressive God, that's basically, how did you say it? An unruly. Uh, I don't, I don't remember. Uh, At at the beginning of the episode here, you base the, the perception that the satanic temple has on that story is a, is rebelling against a, what kind of God? Uh, uh, an authoritarian yeah, god, okay. uh, un, undue authority. Undue authority, authority that's what I was looking for. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. Now, now, the important thing that I need to clarify here is that I'm just a member of the Satanic Temple. I'm not a spokesperson right. for the sure. temple. And so, you know, I'll, I'll really only speak for what I Absolutely. think. I, I can't Absolutely. speak for what other Satanists So I just, I, I thought that was interesting. So my question to you is, ha- like, what what is your handling of the different sort of narratives? Do you say, oh yeah, well they're they're all interesting. They all have a a place in learning, um, or or do you see some of them as more accurate? Does that make sense? Or or you're probably thinking outside of 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 that sort of logic um, altogether. Honestly, uh, that's a that's a really really great question. It's a bit difficult to answer. Yeah. I think I think fundam- you know, I I agree with you in that I don't think Adam and Eve is a literal story. Right. Um but you know, I think the moment we enter that territory, we enter the world of interpretation. Yeah. You know, we we enter the the realm of art. This is no longer history, it's now art. Yeah. And art by its nature is subjective and that that in no way is that a demeaning quality of of genesis i i think that that actually i think that's a higher view of scripture right. than the literalist view of scripture right. you know and and so you know we've we've moved out of history into the world of art and art is subjective and so i i think that these symbols are deeply powerful right I think, you know, I think the symbol of the serpent, I think the, you know, these are archetypes, the, the archetype of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that's an archetype, but I don't think that our interpretation of these archetypes is absolute. And, you know, so I guess that's all I can say is I, I don't, yeah, I don't think our interpretation of these archetypes is absolute, especially when you consider how different social groups, uh, because of their experience their individual experience their group experience uh 
how they will kind of filter those stories and understand them where, you know, for someone maybe more within a majority who identifies with the majority culture of Christianity and for whom it really doesn't cause much problems, they will identify with the idea of a God as a loving, compassionate figure. However, for someone like myself, and I, and by the way, I do identify with that. I do love the idea of a compassionate, loving God. And, uh, and I love the figure of Christ. Uh, but then also on the other hand, take someone who is a trans person, take someone who is an LGBT person for whom suddenly the Eden of the church and the God of that church suddenly no longer feels like this, uh, you know, loving, benevolent, all powerful guiding figure. He feels like a gaslighting, abusive monster. And, and suddenly this, these stories, these archetypal stories take on a different meaning. You know, there's really a therapeutic value to these reframings of these stories because it helps, it can help a lot of people who have been part of a minority to, uh, to claim their experience. Right. And that's the power of stories. Now, so with the satanic temple not uh, at, uh, believing in supernatural why pay attention to this story at all? Just because it is a very historical story that a lot of Christians look at in a certain way, and it's kind of their way of saying, hey, here are the foundation. We're going to take this story and and explain to you what we're about using this story. I mean, is, is that is that the interest in, in that? And, and then even forming, you know, having the name Satanic Temple, for instance. You, you're basically calling yourselves something that you don't really believe in at all anyway Mm. that would be a great question for for some of the uh national council members of the temple i i um but you know for myself i think that I, I think that we are so steeped in these stories, it's impossible to get away from sure. them. Yeah, that's and a good point. So, you know, we're, it's almost like we're, I think that a good case can be made that we're all Christians in some shape or form. We, yeah. we are yeah. culturally so deeply Christian. And even if someone is an atheist, I think that there is a good argument to be made that our culture is steeped in these religious symbols and so um i think it i think it has a lot to do with that and and just identifying with more identifying with the character of satan than with the image of of god because of the persecution that certain people groups have gone through you know another important part of this is that historically um historically People of color have been accused of being children of Satan. Homosexuals were considered satanic. Jewish people were considered satanic. Okay, so there's this long history within Christianity of aligning certain people groups with Satan. And so part of the reason why the temple, well, part of the reason why I call myself uh, a Satanist and a member of the Satanic Temples because I'm drawn to the idea of having a second look at the adversary, having a second look at the social pariah and asking why is he or she or they, why are they who they are? And it's about a curiosity about what got them there. So instead of demonization, it is standing in rebellion against against the taboos, against the taboos of demonization and saying, no, we're going to bestow humanity on this group and we're going to examine what life is like for them uh, because historically um, certain, so many groups have been deemed outside the kingdom of God. For example, little known history, Andrew Solomon in his book, um, uh, Far From the Tree, where he explores all of these different, um, all, all of these different identities far from the norm. He says that, you know, for many centuries, deaf people were considered 
outside of the kingdom of God. Because what did St. Paul say? St. Paul said, salvation comes by hearing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. A legalistic reading okay. of God's word. Yeah, such a, such a literalist, legalistic reading of God's word. Um, so when you, when you start to look at the way certain groups have been aligned with the demonic, with being outside of the kingdom of God, it, it makes sense why certain people want to give Satan himself <laughs> the, the symbol of Satan, to, to reclaim the symbol of Satan as an image of rebellion and defiance against that kind of prejudice that I just yeah. talked about. Now, I say all of this while still yeah. calling myself a Christian, you know, and, and right. still Which adhering I want to, get to, to the... Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I want to get into does that, that in a second. Does that make so, sense? I, I don't it, know how, it how well I'm describing this. No, that's no, that's fine. I, I think it's I think it, it will be it, it's I mean, we, we joked around Justin and I joked around about this, but he was just like, Yeah, Stephen told me that you asked if he was just uh kidding around about that because I was just like, He's <laughs> he's not a Satanist because obviously my mind is thinking, <laughs> you know, worshiper of Satan. But um I, we'll move on from this here in a second. The, the only thing, and, and at least for me in my mind, it, it the, ties up the conversation well. It is extremely, like, if if those that are a part of the satanic temple um, that, that you're a part of as well, if, if they believe in what they're doing, which they do, um, and they feel like it's something that would be good for others to take part in, that is a very it seems like not an advantageous name to take because, you know, even, even though, (laughs) even though I know the baggage that comes with Christianity, like, you know, a lot of people, when they hear Christian, they think, um, you know, just the abuse and the hurt and the pain and the, uh, prejudice and and all that stuff. But it's just like everybody, when they think Satan, they think like evil and destroyer. And it's just like, isn't atheism rebellious enough? Like when it comes, like I've met some atheists. I'm like, man, these are some really, really good people. I mean, they, they do so much better for the world than I do. And yeah, it's, it, I, I'm just, I'm surprised that that group and, and how you're describing them, the, these, they just seem like atheists that really care about people. And I'm just, they do. Yeah, I'm, puzzled <laughs> i'm puzzled that they would just go the satanic temple like that's that's like about as punk rock as you can get <laughs> like, right and, like and you we know care the about most... people and you know what f you guys we're gonna call ourselves satanists <laughs> and we're and we're the satanists you know and, and the most punk rock thing in the world is that you talk to them and they the main thing that i get from them i've done several interviews with people from the national council and the main thing that i get from them is care and intelligence and above all emotional intelligence i mean just the most right. empathetic polite present people i've ever met in my life i mean it's it's really impressive in their online forum their online forum the uh that that i'm part of is the most well-behaved cordial place on the internet i've ever seen (laughs) it's really incredible but you know it i think that's kind of the point i think that's really the point of it because this this satanism is really the test of tolerance if you want a tolerant society, then how much are you going to tolerate someone who calls themselves a Satanist? How yeah. it is the ulti- It's also the ultimate test of religious freedom. If you believe in religious freedom, but you don't allow someone to be a who calls themselves a Satanist to voice their opinions, well, then you aren't for religious freedom. Period. And that's it, in a way, it's kind of a test of the forms of tolerance or acceptance or the principles that many on the Christian right talk about, like religious freedom, and it's ultimately a test of that. Also, you know, even uh, for a lot of the Satanists, I know there are some Satanists for whom it's just purely political. They're in the organization because they like the politics. There are Satanists who... Um, love the irony of it and think it's hilarious. Yeah. And then there are also yeah. Satanists who are still Satanists when they are alone in their bedroom, you know, right. and it is a, and they still have their set of symbols that 
they relate to religiously and they and they see it as a religion um so it, it's an interesting group yeah before before we move on from the satanic temple let me quickly read the the seven short tenets the fundamental tenets of the satanic temple yeah. this is all you need to be down with in right. order to to uh to be a member you this is all you need to affirm and when i read these i was like I'm on. <laughs> you yeah. sign me up. Uh, one should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. The struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. One's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. The freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego one's own. Beliefs should conform to our best scientific understanding of the world. We should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit our beliefs. People are fallible. If we make a mistake, we should do our best to rectify it and rem uh, remediate any harm that may have been caused. Every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. Nice. Doesn't sound too satanic to me, but hey, I'm, yeah. I I'll tell you this, man. We... Um, you know, the other podcast that I'm on, Bad Christian, we totally missed it. We should have called ourselves Satanic Christian. That would have been a lot you more I You uh, know, I've, I've, <laughs> I, I think I'm finding untapped territory here. There you go. <laughs> with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the queer, heretical, fabulous, satanic, non-theistic Christian. <laughs> so, anyway. um I want to I want to get into uh, some comments that you made about being gay and being in the South. But real quick, a, mm. a non-theistic Christian. So I'm going to take a guess and say that you adhere to and try to live out like the serving selflessness uh, teachings of Jesus. But if you're non-theistic, then you don't believe that he's you certainly don't believe that he's God and it sounds like you don't believe in any supernatural either so when you say Christian do you mean basically trying to live out Jesus's teachings yes and it isn't just that you know I, there's also um, the take on the death and the resurrection as a symbol for the death and resurrection of the ego and that we are all called to live into that the the annihilation of the self the annihilation of pride the annihilation of um your sense of self the stories that you tell about yourself uh the total annihilation of that through mystical experience through prayer through service and then the incredible resurrection that comes as a result of that and we're called into that archetypal image of christ dying and rising again um, we're called into that death of ego every single day. So, you know, yeah. so that power and beauty that comes from that story, though, originated with humans. So uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out in my head. So basically, humans came up with that beautiful story of a sacrificial God that helps people put their egos to death and can resurrect into, you know, more humble beings or whatever. But that's still from humans right i th i think so okay. yeah you know i'm I, the way i like to put it is that i'm in a, i'm a very hopeful and open materialist yeah. and the the form of faith the sort of faith that i resonate with is that defined in the book of hebrews where it says the faith is the essence of things hoped for right. well i really hope for an afterlife. Yeah. I really hope that there is a personal and loving God. And I really hope that my savior is Jesus Christ. I do truly hope for that. Um, I hope for the reality of the supernatural, um, maybe more than I have hoped for anything before in my life, ever in my life. Uh, but at the same time, there is this other side of me that I also cannot get rid of, and that is the rational skeptic. And for me to shut down that part of me would be dishonest. Yeah. 
And so for what I can say, what, what I do is I differentiate between what I hope and what I know, yeah. or I know that the material world is real. And I know that the laws of science are real. And I know that in general, I can trust the magisterium of science. And I really cannot say I know anything yeah. beyond that. Yeah. However, I can say that there are things that I hope for. I hope for a spiritual realm, but there is the added layer here that non-theism is uh, is a bit different from the or non-theism is a bit different from atheism. Yeah. Non-theism is a is religion or non-theistic religion is religion that has a lack of concern over the existence of God. In many ways, I see the search for God as just another form of suffering. Yeah. And I have learned finally that the universe doesn't care what I think about it. And I can trust the cosmos, God, whatever you want to call it, that um, my 10 pound brain might not be able to comprehend it. And that's fine. But despite that, I'm still going to do these religious rituals because I find enrichment and value from them. And, uh, and so it's essentially the belief that theism and non-theism are both too limiting. Yeah. They're, they're both too narrow. I, I want to live, um, in that weird in between place. That's, that's comfortable with both comfortable living as if there is a God come. And, and the other thing that, that is confusing here is no, I don't believe in a literal God. And yet I still experience him. You know, I still speak in tongues. I still spontaneously speak in tongues. I still, uh, pray from the Book of Common Prayer just about every day. I still read scripture. I am I am deeply religious, all the while not knowing, not necessarily believing that there is a God who I still personally experience. And, you know, that's the, that's the weirdness of it. Yeah. That's the complicated place where I find myself. I'm, so yeah. It sounds like you're a, uh, so here, here, here it is, Stephen. Sounds like you're a hopeful, born again, evangelical Christian that dabbles in Satanism. <laughs> there you go. Just, yeah, I, I guess so. I'm messing you around. Know? I'm messing around. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you speak in tongues, like what what do you think is going on? Are are you hopeful that it is a personal God speaking through you, or what I know is going on is that uh, the the uh, language centers of my brain are shutting down. Yeah which is why it feels like there is a power surging through me and and why it feels like there's a language taking hold of me, why it feels like there's something coming upon me and through me. It, it feels alien to me, right? I mean, if you've spoken in tongues, you, you probably know that experience. Um, and I know that this is a really healthy practice. I know that it lowers stress. I know that it uh, improves my mood. It keeps depression at bay. That's what I know. Um, I think it's unlikely that it is the tongues of angels speaking through me. But does it matter? Right. Well, you know, why does that matter? The fact is, it's deeply wired into me from my charismatic background. And it's beneficial. So I'm going to keep doing yeah. it, you know. Yeah. And... Um, yeah. And something else that you said, and, and this, I think, to me, is just being so seeped in Christian culture and just th those, they are my lenses, and I have learned to understand people that don't have those lenses, but I don't understand the concept of, I, I think you said trusting the, the cosmos, but just, just the idea of trusting a non-theistic God an impersonal God. I just don't, I don't understand what that means. Is mm -hmm. that like this hopeful thing of, well, if we're all the result of, you know, mother nature, uh, if, if we're all the result of, of materialism, then we can just trust the process or I don't know if we can trust the process, but I'm just going to anyway. Like what, what does that mean? I, I, just I think it's the latter of what you just said. You know, it's the idea that, um, when I say I'm going to trust the universe, yeah. <laughs> which sounds so, you know, disgustingly Oprah-esque, <laughs> but, you know, what I, what I mean when I say that is I trust that it's okay that my brain 
is not evolved to understand it. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. And it doesn't require me understanding whether or not there is a God will ultimately have no effect upon the universe one way or the other. And I can live a life fully and beautifully in spite of that fact. And that's that's what I mean when I say I trust. I, I trust the universe to be as huge and complex and mysterious as it is. And, and, it, and that trust is, maybe trust is the wrong word. Maybe it's just an admission of the beauty and mystery and, and awe that I experience when I behold the universe. You know, a lot of us talk about the existence of God as if what we believe about God is going to change the universe. You know, you hear people, you hear a lot of apologists say, well, if there is no God, then that means that the universe has no meaning. Or if there is a God, then that means that there is meaning. The universe doesn't care one way or the other. It, the universe is what it is. Yeah. And our job is to just be as fully present to it as we possibly can. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, my, my mind immediately goes to the universe doesn't care at all because it doesn't have the capacity. But I think you're being. Allegorical. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm being I, very I, allegorical. Yeah, I, I get yeah. what you're saying. So with with uh it, it sounds like you and i have probably been uh raised similarly with similar upbringings if there is so you 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 are hoping you know you're uh, a, a hopeful theist and a personal loving god if there is a god does your mind do you find your mind going towards a oh shoot but if that's true then maybe me and a bunch of my pals are going to go to hell. Like what, where, or have you distanced yourself so far from, from that aspect of God to where your mind goes, no, if there's a loving God, he's, he's got shit under control and people are going to be fine. I'm act. I actually have other, I have other fears. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel like the concept of hell has really, really disturbed me and upset me, me too. for my entire life. You know, it's it's very awful. Um, no matter what the Calvinist apologists say to me to try to make it seem okay, I, I can never make it okay. Oh, they make it in worse. My head. Calvinists make they it make it worse. worse. Oh God, yeah, they they may totally make it worse. And you know, but lately that hasn't been the question. That's really bothered me yeah. the, the question that bothers me is if there is a personal god then that raises really terrible questions about that god's innate goodness yeah. because take the question of miracles if he heals so one person why does he not heal another yeah. and that then requires us a level of um blind trust you know i know i used the word trust earlier you know a few minutes ago, but it, this require that requires a blind trust in in a God who arbitrarily decides to heal one person but not the other, and that raises very alarming questions about the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God. It does raise questions about why why mass starvation if there is a personal God? Why? The Holocaust, and I know that these are, you know, the typical basic, right, sure. you know, questions. Why mental illness? You know, I live with mental illness, and there are some people who live in hells that I cannot even imagine. Why that? And so I, I am confronted with questions that ab about the nature of the world that a good God would a good personal God would have a very hard time fitting into. Uh, I, and that raises alarming questions about the nature of God himself. Yeah. You know? and, and it's here's how my mind is, is wired with all that. And, and uh, two of my friends that I do bad Christian with to them, is just like, no, that doesn't fix things. But in my mind, I know it sounds so messed up and maybe even insensitive to people that have, suffered such tragedy and oppression and all that and i, I mean I, I suffer from depression so that's that's something that is extremely painful and has been through my whole life but to me if there is an eternity and add to that everybody goes there for me that solves it in my head because i could see things working out this way mm. that we are not living in the the best possible place that god 
is capable of creating, but we are living in a place, uh, the means in which God will be able to bring us to the best possible place that he created. So let's just say there is something mm. to free will and that we cannot really experience true love from God and 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 really experiencing rejecting him and, and how he will show us love and kindness throughout all eternity, even though people rejected him. And, and you know, just... But but yeah, that's that's a tough one though. When you really get to the detailed stuff of sexual abuse and people being tortured yeah. to death and and those sorts of things, I know it's not that simple. But I don't know. There's something in my head that's just like if God has forever to make it up to people and show them His love, then maybe you know eternity is something that my mind can't even wrap my wrap it around so it's just like maybe there's something to that i don't know all right so yeah no that's that's very interesting so that's how that's how it works for you that that's how you can kind of let it work yeah for you that yeah for question. sure because i okay I, I still do. sure I, I you know i'm uh not only a christian but still um you know death and rex- resurrection of jesus it's like um mm-hmm. i think that i have just recently um, understood other perspectives outside of the whole penal substitution. Um, we interviewed yes. uh, Paul Young, the writer of The Shack, and then um, I think Greg Boyd is another. Oh, uh, Greg Boyd is wonderful. Yeah, I think he. I, yeah, he's so, great. So he helped clear that stuff up because I used to think, my gosh, if if, if Jesus didn't die because he had to, then then why would he? And I, I think I've gotten some really good answers on that too. But yeah, and mm, I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm still at a place where I believe in, you know, literal Jesus, Savior, you know, he's He's God and all that. And so, yeah, for me, I make sense of, of the pain of this world. Now, I'll tell you what, my gosh, when I used to um, really believe that majority of people were going to go to hell, I remember when my, um, I mean, gosh, she most of the time that I knew her, she was divorced from my blood uncle. So she's not even uh, necessarily family, but you know, she, they got a divorce. She became super depressed, abused alcohol, abused drugs, was just lived a horrible existence. And then when she died, I thought to myself, she lived the shittiest life and she just woke up being burned alive and Mm. that's going to be her forever and it just broke me because i was like this is a real person that lived a horrible life was sad her whole life and then god's like yeah and and you know what you screwed up you didn't choose me so now it's just going to be a billion times worse forever and ever um and then throw on top of the fact that if calvinists are right she never had a shot to begin with i mean that stuff yeah uh, there's no way I it's can scary out of that. No way. I can it, there's, I you know I'm a big fan of horror, and I think I, one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of horror is a I I've lived with some pretty severe mental illness, and so I relate to horror. But also, I love horror because I think it explores horrifying ideas, horrifying potentials in the world, and what is a more horrifying potential than the hard Calvinistic God. What is a worse, what is, and and the idea of hell, like what is the worst horror that you can think of than the God of John Calvin? Um, And, you know, I just remember in high school, because I I went through, I, I went to a very conservative Christian high school, and I just remember staying up at night, staring at the ceiling, panicking, terrified, wondering if I'm one of the elect. How do I know if I'm one of the elect? And that, que- it just tortured me. And, you know, I think it was kind of a form of child abuse, honestly. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely those sorts of things, too. It's really raised questions with what what is important to my children right now. Like, I've got four kids, 11 and under, and... I just kind of want to live my life out in the open, talk about what I believe. I mean, you know, it, it, it it's part of their life that I am a pastor. So for them, yes, they are a part of church culture and all that stuff. But I, I am not trying to make sure I have fine tuned exactly what they believe, because honestly, it sucks for them. But their dad doesn't know exactly what he believes. And so I'm not trying to hide that from them. I'm just saying, look, I think that's great. This is where I'm at right now. 
this is what I believe. I really do think you can trust Jesus. I mean, my daughter, and, and I didn't teach her this. This is, and I think it's a product of Southern culture and then just our daggone spence and genetics. But my daughter came up to me and said, Dad, I feel so bad because there are sometimes I have a hard time believing. And I don't, I, that's, that scares me because I don't want hmm. God to be upset, but I just, I have a heart. And I was like, look, I was like, Winnie, here, here is the good news is that uh, if if there is a God uh, that is very loving, like we believe that he is, and you're having a hard time believing in him, he is okay with that. Like you are exactly fine and dandy. And I he's, said, he's big enough. That. He's big enough to deal with the questions. Exactly. exactly. But all right. So um, I, I love how you uh, worded this. You said the deep trauma that you experienced as a gay person has informed nearly every aspect of your life and deeply transformed how you relate to religion. My, mm. my, I too assume that you are not an evangelical Christian or um, mainstream Christian. I don't. I don't know what to put in because I don't want to necessarily say you're not an evangelical Christian, but you're not a traditional Christian. Um, that believes in death and resurrection of Jesus and all of those, what people would call mm. essentials. You're not that because of how people treated you in the church. Is that safe to say or not, not simple? Not no. Simple? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, no, I, you know, I actually feel like I pretty well, I, I reconciled my homosexuality to my faith pretty well. I mean, to kind of my conservative Orthodox faith. I I reconciled it fairly well. Now, that process was harrowing. Yeah. I mean, that process was just torture and took years, but I did it. It wasn't my orientation that I think eventually destroyed my faith. That came along with much deeper, deeper stuff. Um, but, you know, I can't imagine that my homosexuality didn't have an effect on that eventually sure. because, you know, I, I think one of the qualities of being gay is you, uh, it, it requires you to not take things for granted. And, um, you know, I think when you are part, of course, of course I'm, generalizing here you know i know i know a lot of uh gay people who who have the mental uh presence of a crustacean and i know people in majorities who are very uh thoughtful and questioning so you know of course i'm i'm not i i'm generalizing here and of course it doesn't apply to everyone but i think a common trend with people in a minority is that it, it requires us to not take everything for granted and and we're more likely to uh to challenge and ask questions and I, I can't imagine that that didn't have an effect on my eventual eventual deterioration of my faith but i mean really my questions about faith go way back and they've always been with me and and um but the ways in which homosexuality has shaped my view of the world, I, I think it's made me, um, just like I said, more prone to asking very hard questions yeah. because I had to challenge what felt like established orthodoxy, which was homosexuality is a sin. Um, I, I think it made me, I think it's made me more empathetic yeah. because um, it, 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 because I want to treat other people now in the way that I wish I had been treated in yeah. high school, the way I wish I had been treated in college. That's, um, That's really cool. I, I, and so I, it has made me a more empathetic person because I now have the opportunity to treat other people the way I wish I had been treated by the church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I ask that because uh, like a good, a good, uh, Oh, we are not, good friends we were back in high school but we just lost touch but he was like ultra evangelical youth group king man i mean just uh everyone was like that dude's got his stuff together then he went off to college um realized he was you know started to come face to face with his sexual orientation and um i had him on the show and i was talking to him and, and he definitely sounded like he turned his back on on God 
because of how people in the church treated him. And, and we talked about it a little bit, but I, I never could understand that. Now, I can understand, look, I'm not having anything to do with this if this is how you guys are like. But if you believe in a loving God, it seems like there's a distinction with, well, these assholes have it wrong, but I'm still with this guy who does love me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, that was my stance. You know, I always believed wholeheartedly that Jesus loved me no matter what. Yeah. And, you know, I, in fact, kind of what early on as I was coming out of the closet and still did not know what I believed about myself. And it was, it took me years. I mean, it, um, I went through ex-gay therapy or, or I went through the ex-gay world in high school. And then I left that when I was 20 because I realized it wasn't working. But then I was presented with the question, well, now what? And it didn't take me till I was about 26 to, to finally come to the realization that I don't have the luxury anymore to have a non-affirming view of my homosexuality, that I have to be open to having a relationship because the alternative was quite literally killing me because of its implications on my life. And, you know, we can talk about that later. But, you know, what? But at no point, of, of course I questioned whether God still loved me. Of course I questioned whether... I was um, trespassing the love or grace of God. But early on uh, in this process, I had kind of a, I had a mystical experience, which still really um, affects me. Uh, this, and it was when I was in the process of converting to Catholicism, I ended up not converting. Weed or no weed? Um, mushrooms or no mushrooms? Just totally. Uh, no, no mushrooms. <laughs> However, I am very interested in, in psilocybin and might be doing an episode about that, but that's another topic. Um, but no, so without mushrooms, and this was when I was in the process of converting and I was at a Catholic church, I was in mass and I remember I was on my knees, uh, during, in prayer. And all of a sudden I felt the space filled with the presence of God, with the love of God. And I heard the voice of God say, you know, not auditorily, but but internally, I felt the voice of God say, Stephen, do you remember that time when you were in high school and you were going through a really, really, really rough time and you were in bed falling asleep and then your dad came into the room and he held you in his arms and he said into your ear, Stephen, it doesn't matter what you do, you will always be my son, and I will always love you, and you can never change that, and my house will always be your house. And I felt the voice say, I am like your biological father in that way. I'm a good father, and I don't kick my children out. Yeah which means that you have the freedom to take your time and figure this out. Yeah. Now, now when you look back on that now, are, would, would you say the best way to describe that is you are hopeful that that was a personal God, or do you discount that possibility now? Um, I don't know, honestly. It, I definitely describe it as a mystical experience. But, you know, there's, you know, one of my favorite quotes um, is is at the very end of the Harry Potter series, and Harry is having a vision of Dumbledore and King's Cross Station. Yeah. And at one point during the conversation, Harry looks at Dumbledore and says, "Is this all in my head?" Right. And Dumbledore says, "Of course, it's all in your head, Harry. Why on earth does that mean it isn't real?" Right. Yep. You know, and and so regardless of whether it was God or not, it still changed my life. It was still real. Yeah. It it was still real in a tangible way. And I still experienced it as real, you know? And, and so that's why I still value these mystical experiences. In a way, I feel like the question of whether it was God or not is irrelevant. I hope, I don't know, I'm doubtful, 
catch me on a certain day and I'll say something different. But no matter what, you know, regardless of all that, it still probably saved my life, you know? Right. Gosh, that's interesting because, I mean, just being honest in this conversation, like my my head goes to, well, if it's not God, then eh, that sucks because it doesn't mean anything. And and you just yeah. explain why it does mean something to you. It still matters. Yeah. You know, Mike McArg, a.k.a. Science Mike, he said something really powerful. Is He said, um, oh, I can't, I'll botch this. But he said, I, I'm going to put words in his mouth saying this. But what I absolutely remember him saying is, what I know is that Jesus saved me. Yeah. Because when he was in school, life was so hard and so miserable and his faith was so strong, it saved him. Yeah. Jesus saved him. And, you know, now he's he's much more of a non-theist like I am. And I can agree with him. Jesus saved me. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. the idea, the concept, the archetype, the person, right. whoever or whatever that is, it saved me. And what I believe about that doesn't really right. matter. That's interesting because I was going to bring him up because a lot of how you're articulating yourself reminds me of some of the stuff that he wrote in his book where, where you actually do have two parts of your brain functioning. I mean, you've got absolutely mystical. Absolutely. I want this stuff to be true. I, I can receive it, but then you have the more skeptical side saying, Oh, this, there's no way this is not science. Exactly. It does not work, you know, and that I, and, and I don't think everyone's minds have that, that sort of calibration. You know, I, yeah, the, you know, the scale will, of, will be in different. Yeah. There will be different degrees. Exactly. Where that arrow is pointing right. will be different for different. I'm and you know, despite, you know, despite how, you know, people think of me as maybe a more rational, thoughtful person. I think of myself as a deeply spiritual, deeply gullible, deeply hopeful and religious person. I think of myself as someone who will probably deep within my soul always believe in the supernatural, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to rid myself of that. Right. Uh, but then there's this other part of me, and you know, to me, it's now about authenticity. It's I can't shut down one or the other because that, for me, means death. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the last thing I want to ask you is you 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 know talked about how. A lot of what you're after is is humanization um, of people who think, feel, and experience the world differently. How does that, in your mind, apply to, mm, let's just call them evangelical, fundamentalist, gay-hating, Trump-worshipping assholes? Mm, that's a great question. You mean how... Um, how do I go about doing that for them? Yeah. To, uh, yeah. Or do you think it's, do you think that's the humanization is important for those people too when it comes absolutely. to your drive to humanize them? Well, and, and, you know, I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think anything less uh, is a crime. Yeah. I mean, I, th I do love, I do still like the word sin and I think we need to retain it. And I think it is a sin to not humanize people. Now, humanization does not mean forgiving or, or not, not forgive is the wrong word. Humanization does not mean pardoning or making excuses for right. or or even saying that they're OK in what they believe. That's not what it means. In fact, I think humanization leads to some really dark and scary places. I think humanization leads to leads us to face the fact that people can do the very best they can with what life has given them doing what they think is right. And at the end of the day, it is still an atrocious monstrosity. Sure. And that's scary. That's hard. You know, and so I think humanization at the end of the day is a very hard and difficult thing and we have to do it to everyone. And it may lead us to some really dark places. Yeah. You know, it may lead us to, to some scary places that we're not really, that a lot of us aren't willing to face. Unfortunately, how you describe that, I think, is very, very rare. And uh, like, yeah. I, I, it's, it's frustrating to me not from the standpoint of, man, I'm so frustrated with this, you know, progressive uh, post-Christian that's going off on Twitter and all that. I'm not, 
not frustrated with <laughs> Well, there's them. a lot to be frustrated, right. I, honestly. I'm, I'm frustrated with the fact that I think they could bring so much to the table. They are bringing so much to the table, but they could bring so much to the table to those people they're mad at by not responding that way and by saying, you know what, I totally disagree with you, but I'm still going to speak to you like a human. I'm still going to honor the fact that you aren't how you are because of the flip of a coin. Like you are how you are because of your upbringing, your cultural exactly. lenses. Like you didn't just become this, you know, overnight. And it's just so frustrating because there are so many people that they have great intentions. They really do want to stand up for, uh, you know, people that that are taken advantage of and, and people that do have prejudices against them and everything. But it just seems so counterproductive because the people that need to learn that same sort of love that you have found, you don't have them as an audience anymore. They're not going to listen to you because they feel insulted by you. And and and, yeah. and, and maybe there is a time and a place to tell it like it is and, and stick it to them. But it just seems to be that's. That's not going to be the solution nine times out of ten. You know, I really agree with that with, you know, with some caveats. But in general, I agree with that. And I'm not going to say that I've been the perfect model of this. Yeah. And I'm also not going to say that there are no times for for vitriol. You know, I certainly think that there are times for fury. Sure and and protesting and and all of that you know there's time for that but you know in general i you know i'm not going to say that i've always been the you know the most um the most christ-like person on social media i'm not going to say that i've always been the most hospitable person but my kind of the practice that i have been trying to cultivate is is just one of curiosity and I, I think curiosity is maybe the most radical and powerful thing that we can have in our digital age right now yeah. of just asking why, why is this person saying this? Why are they this way? Why, why has their experience led them to this point? Just why in general? And, and frankly, I don't, I, I don't think any of us ask that question enough, yeah. including myself. And, you know, my and what I have found is that knowledge never works against me. Right. Knowing never, ever works against me. Understanding never works against me. And if my goal is to win, if my goal, I am a progressive, I am a leftist, I, I'm the queer your parents warned you about. I'm very much a leftist, but you know, if my goal is to win, then there are simply certain ploys, techniques, and methods that will accomplish that. Yeah. And you know, yeah. And I think one of those methods is curiosity. Yeah. And also, you know, one of the methods is also to not be, you know, a a hand wringing sop who just never confronts anyone. You know, I don't believe in that either. I believe in in saying what I believe. Oh. You know, I don't think hiding what I think will is ever useful. But um, I'd say to put it like this: just don't throw away respect for humans and, and honoring the fact that we are ultimately team humanity and and and. Yes, it, that has to mean something. It just has to mean something, you know, I mean, and it's going to look differently for different people. And I agree. I think some people are meant to be angry a little bit more. And there does need the LGBTQ uh, community does need straight people to be pissed off on their behalf and to go off on Twitter. But I just wish that more people would not forfeit a respect and honor of just human beings, you know. I agree. Well, also, there's just the problem with the platform in general, yeah. where I'm, I think that things like Twitter and social media in general are doing really awful things to us as a society. Yeah. I think the idea of social media is great. And I have a lot of hope for it. I think as a technology, it's wonderful. But in its current iteration, I think it does more bad than good. 
you know. So yeah. What will people get on uh, at, at Sacred Tension? Tell people a little bit about your podcast. Oh, well, at Sacred Tension, you will hear from Satanists. You will hear lots of queer stories of people coming out and their life as LGBT people. You will uh, talk, you will hear from theologians, religious scholars. We talk a lot about cults. We talk about um, uh, political theory. We talk about current big figures like Jordan Peterson. We talk about Christian films and pop culture. Uh, and we have lots of really interesting conversations between fascinating people. Well, this has been very fascinating, man. I appreciate your time. Yeah, it's a it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome.